This is the so-called old Izaslav Cemetery, which, as local people say, in general no one visits. The place is amazing. Field, cows, and remains of gravestones. Everything resembles the ruins of an ancient city. This is the end of the chapter for the Jews of Izaslav, who made up half of the city's population in the 18th to 19th centuries. Here are the stones of that time. Some are standing, and most are lying down. Our family roots are in Izaslav. Our ancestors lived in Izaslav in the 18th and 19th centuries. In the second half of the 19th century, my grandfather, Tsal Kaplun, moved to a small shuttle called Krasnostav, 55 kilometers from Izaslav. There he married, opened a shop, then a pharmacy and a mill. Seventy years later, the new Bolshevik government expropriated our family property and savings, and my grandfather Moshe Kaplun was forced to flee Zaslav in 1930, escaping the prosecution of the Krasnostav authorities. We've come full circle. We returned to Zaslav. In any town, there is a place where it starts, where it came into existence, so to speak. And it was the old town, the old part of Izaslev, at the convergence of two rivers, Horn and Panorka, where there appeared a place now called Zaslavsky Castle, or sometimes called Rogoneda Castle. Before the war, it was quite a large hill, but only a third of its previous size remains to this day. The writer Aaron Berenboim, a native of Izaslav, said, Our Izaslav looks good in June. It is all green, divided by the quiet hoarding. Izaslav residents don't notice the beauty of their city, but its guests always pay attention to our picturesque spots right away. Zaslav is Izaslav's old name. It is one of the oldest cities in Valinia, in the northwestern part of Ukraine. It was founded in the 13th century. The Grand Duke of Lithuania, Gediminas, was its owner since 1321. And 150 years later, the Lithuanian Marshal Peter Karol Sangushko became the master of the city. Magdeburg rights were granted to Izaslav in 1583. During the 15th to 17th centuries, Izaslav was a large economic center. It was compared with Yaroslavl, Lviv and Lublin. The Emperor Peter I honored the city with his visit in 1711. And in 1870 and 1878, Izaslav was graced with the visit of the Austrian Emperor Joseph II. After the annexation of Ukraine to the Russian Empire at the end of the 18th century, Izaslav became a provincial center. In 1897, 12,611 people lived there. They were Ukrainians, Jews, Poles, Russians and Germans. Essentially, we are walking on a street that's typical of the old Izaslav, small and winding. Right now, we are passing over the old bank of the Horn River. To protect the buildings up above, the retaining wall was built. Here, you can see the wall, which is almost 200 years old and it retained large houses above. And on this spot stood the Grand Synagogue of Izaslav. Izaslav. 
These stones are in fact what used to be the main synagogue of Izaslav. They are like the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. Before the revolution, the synagogue looked different. Izaslav historian Pavel Zoltovsky remembers. When I entered the synagogue, I'd get enveloped in a feeling of something strange, a little exotic. Peculiar characters of sacred texts, mysterious symbols for me, free movement and expressive cries of worshippers. They say that a valuable copy of the Torah was kept in the synagogue, allegedly brought from Spain years ago. In the 1920s, a fire broke out in the synagogue. It was rebuilt, but soon after that, the synagogue was closed. The remains of the sacred scrolls were solemnly buried at the Jewish cemetery. Meanwhile, the synagogue building was used as a garment and shoe factory. Jews began to settle in Izaslav in the first half of the 16th century. They were engaged in trade, crafts, and even managed the estates of the Polish gentry. In 1765, 2,800 Jews lived in the city. And it was this multicultural society, where there were Ukrainians, Poles, and Jews, and there was some kind of a cross-cultural dialogue. It was the time when Jews celebrated Shabbat, when Jews were leading their ethnic cultural life, when candles were lit every Friday night, when a Jewish woman and a Jewish man would say their prayers. It was traditional Jewish life on the territory of Ukrainian Podolia, on the right bank, Ukraine. According to Aaron Berenboim, Orthodox peasants and Cossacks hated Jews who are often intermediaries between landowners and peasants. Many rich Jews rented land, estates and mills from the landowners. And the peasants dealt with the Jewish leaseholders more than with the landowners themselves. And when the Bogdan Khmelnytsky uprising began in 1648, Jews also fell victim to the Cossack sabers. The period of Melnitsky in the 17th century was both in Slavuda and Shepetkova. All these were the sites of Jewish settlements, shtetls. After the pogroms, Jewish life in the settlements fell into ruin. Rabbi Nathan Hanover, an outstanding scientist, historian and Kabbalist who lived in the 17th century, described the destruction of Izaslav at the hands of Bogdan Khmelnytsky's forces. They plundered the entire Jewish community and killed about 200 people from those who remained there, who were too ill to escape. And the Jews hid in the woods, waiting for the storm to pass. They spent a lot of time there, were hungry, thirsty, and barely alive. When they returned to the city, fellow townspeople grabbed them, wishing to kill them. Jews asked to be killed at the cemetery so that they could receive proper burial. Their request was honored. They were taken to the cemetery. Jews entered the house located at the cemetery and were all killed there, while the house was then burned. We find ourselves on the ruins of the Sangushko Palace. The owner of the vast estates and a magnificent palace, Prince Sangushko was a very influential 18th century nobleman. Here, in the palace, the powerful prince himself signed a decree that subjected Jews accused of the ritual murder of a Christian to a judicial inquiry. The court 1747 ruling read, By order of Prince Sangushko, the regional Magdeburg court of his royal grace of the city of Kremenets arrived in the city of Zaslav to investigate the charges against some infidel Jews accused of shedding Christian blood. Fourteen Jews were accused of killing a Christian and using his blood to make matzos. 
but only one accused confessed under torture. Nevertheless, an unjust libel prevailed. Four innocent Jews were executed, while the rest received long prison sentences. In the late 18th and early 19th century, the Jewish community recovers. This was commerce and economic relations and the relationship with the Poles and Ukrainians. At the end of the 19th century, the community expanded and Jews continued to be a large part of Izaslav's cultural space. These are people who are actively involved in both economy and culture. This is a great number of people. Before the war, it was greater than 50% or more. These people are the face of the city. They are teachers and lawyers and salesmen. Their spoken language is Yiddish. They pray in Hebrew. This is in part the face of Jews in Ukraine, Izaslav Podolia. In the 19th century, the Jewish community of Izaslav grew significantly. In 1897, half of this city's population, 6,000 people, were Jewish. Many Jews also lived in townlets around Izaslav in Balagorodica, Kunev, and Pluzhny. Before World War I, the Jewish population had increased to 7,000. The activities of the Jewish community expanded as well. By the end of the 19th century, the community acquired a hospital, a bookstore, a library, and a dozen schools. Historically, the Jewish community boasted high literacy rates. 79% of Jews could read and write, while 49% of Ukrainians were literate. Jews mainly lived in the area of the old city. They were people with different professions. Teachers, physicians, they were actively involved in commerce and leased the land. As a rule, they were literate. In the old city, there was a large synagogue with an interesting history. It was built at the end of 18th century. The heart of every Jewish small town, even ones like Izaslev, was the town market. This was where you received news, where new goods were bought, handcrafted, artisanal, manufactured. This was the place where they traded, exchanged news, and lived. And it is in such a market that we are now. And this was typical tradesmen's building in the 19th century, in which small stores were located on the first floor, and the second floor was where they lived. Whole families, for generations. This is where the active business life took place. The economic prosperity of the 19th and early 20th centuries was a thing of the past. The new government abolished private property. The massive confiscation of property and the arbitrariness of the authorities led to devastation. In 1932, the Soviet government took away both grain and livestock from Ukrainian peasants. So, in the fertile Ukraine, the breadbasket of the Russian Empire, famine was provoked, which claimed millions of lives. Milestones of time. Izyaslav Monastery becomes a prison. A symbol of splendor, the Sangushko Palace, turns into ruins, only reminiscent of its former greatness. Revolution, civil war, constant pogroms, all this disrupted the life of the once prosperous Jewish community. Half of the Jewish population left Izaslav. Some managed to escape to America or neighboring Poland.
Может быть, эту Тору держали в руках родители Леонардо Немо. Perhaps Leonard Nimoy's parents, Orthodox Jews who fled from Soviet Izaslav to Poland in the early 1920s and later immigrated to Boston, held this Torah in their hands. We know Leonard Nimoy as Commander Spock in Star Trek. However, few people know that Leonard was raised in a religious Jewish family. The famous Vulcan salute he came up with for the series is borrowed from Judaism. Shahina, the personification of God on Earth, looks at the worshippers through parted fingers and blesses them. This modest building belonged to the last synagogue in the Zaslav, which was shut down by the Soviet authorities in 1926. Jewish schools were closed in 1924. Judaism became a forbidden religion. In the heyday of Jewish life in Izaslav, in the 19th century, 14 synagogues operated in the city. I was born in the city of Izaslav. My father was a tailor by trade and my grandfather was a tailor too. They were born in Izaslav. My mother, father, and grandfather, they were all born in Izaslav. My parents, my father, Zalman Yukimovich Finkel, also lived in the city of Izaslav. Father worked as a tailor, a pattern cutter at the military surplus store. He sewed military uniforms. My mother worked in the same trade as a seamstress. She was a master sewer of male trousers. Her life was trouble-free. They were well off. Mother and father made a good living, and there was nothing they would deny us, their children. What was the percentage of Jewish population? Jews must have made up 50% of the entire population. The rest were Ukrainians, Czechs, and Germans who lived in the vicinity. Even the stamp of the city council was kept in two languages. Half was in Ukrainian and the other half was in Hebrew. 
They were very religious, especially Grandpa. I know that Grandpa wouldn't even allow himself to smoke a cigarette on Saturday, even though he was a heavy smoker. Did Stalin's reprisals affect inhabitants of your city? Oh, absolutely. My father had one sister. Her husband was arrested in 1937 as an enemy of the people. He was from Poland, and in 1937 he was arrested as an enemy of the people. My father worried a lot. Next door, our neighbors were a Ukrainian family with six children, four boys and two girls. And their father was taken away in 1937 as an enemy of the people. They would stop by our place, eat at our table, and their mother would come over. We were really good neighbors. I remember my uncle who was arrested in 1937. He was the eldest of my father's brothers. For what was he arrested and how did that happen? It happened this way. He and my father went to the river for a swim, and he was arrested right by the river. He must have been around 40. He was a tailor. He wouldn't make peace with someone if they said something they shouldn't have. And that's it. That was enough to arrest him. And he disappeared without a trace straight away. And I believed them with my whole heart. My understanding was that he truly was an enemy of the people, and that he had done something. I remember we were singing the songs, let me recall, ah, long live comrade Stalin, who decided to give us passports. However, despite Stalin's purges, the city lived a vibrant cultural life before the war, and Jewish musicians played an important role in it. Isyaslav Klezmer's played at weddings, dances, and simply in town during the holidays. The profession of a musician was often passed down from father to son. The majority knew musical notes well, some also wrote music. Here's how beautifully and wistfully Aaron Barenboim writes about that time. Pinas or Mayer's violin is crying with pain, or maybe sadness. The tall Sanya's clarinet sobs, Aesop's bass hums with short sighs, Srulik drums the quick beat of a frisky polka. Have fun, poor man. Nobody yet knows that ten years later, many of them will traverse the martyr's trail to the tank caponiers dug outside the city at the beginning of the war. Others will remain lying in a huge pit in the valley of a river with the beautiful name of Soshinka. And what did you hear about Poland? About Poland, I heard that we had liberated it. Poland of Pons is no longer. The sly witch is no more. Poland won't get any of our brothers in the work. Who said that? Those were the songs that we were singing. When? When he attacked Poland when ours stepped in and liberated Western Ukraine and Western Belarusia. And what about Polish refugees when Hitler came to power? They were here, they came, but nobody believed that he would shoot people just because one was a Jew. We knew in the newspapers that these things happened, that there were killings and such. This was just written, but no one believed it. That was the whole secret. No one believed it could be so. How do you just kill people? The photo was taken in 1936 in Izyaslav, when the children and grandchildren came to visit their grandfather Moisha and grandmother Krynce in the summer. Five years later, many of them perished in the Holocaust. And what do you think? Did any anti-Semitism manifest in something before the war? We heard nothing of the sort before the war against Jews. We lived in the city, and we didn't hear about either any murders or thefts. 
And in everyday life, did you ever hear an offensive word towards you? Did something like that happen before the war? No. There wasn't any anti-Semitism. They were not against Jews. It's the Germans that taught them. How did your neighbors treat you, your family, and Jews in general? They treated me loyally, very well. We were all friends. We always helped each other. If something was needed, nobody refused to help with something. Nobody felt the burden of being a Jew. Everybody enjoyed equal rights. In der Ukraine. Before World War II, 3,200 Jews lived in Izaslav. The war began suddenly. Few people were able to evacuate to the east. Most remained in the city, also joined by refugees from the western regions. We had the same clothes on our backs as we had when we left home, when we decided, well, to evacuate. After all, we were evacuating. We only made it to Zitomir, and Germans turned out to be even closer. They were ahead of us, and we had to come back. This is how Mother came back with us. After we had left the apartment, nobody ever let us back in the apartment again. The war started on June 22nd, and on June 30th, a German assault force parachuted into Pluzhny, 20 kilometers from Izaslav. People were already panicking, and on July 6th, Germans entered the city. And how did your grandma and grandpa behave when they learned that you guys had come back? Why are you worried? Germans are good people. We know them from the last war. They had a good relationship with Jews. I personally read that they immediately started posting their leaflets. Beat the Jews and the communists. They drew all kind of caricatures and posters, depicting Stalin with a long nose, and they wrote everywhere, down with the Jewish Bolshevist authority, and so on and so forth. After that, quite soon they began the humiliation. Jews were supposed to wear a yellow circle on the front of the right side and on their shoulders. And if they stopped a Jew, who didn't have that identification, they were shot. You said that, in fact, before the war, you lived in harmony with Ukrainians and there were no conflicts. And did anything change in the behavior of your neighbors towards you right away? Right away? Right away. There wasn't even yet a ghetto. So we are walking and one guy says, hey, look, do you see that Jew there? I went to school with him. Actually, one could really feel it. In fact, Germans didn't know who was a Jew and who was not a Jew. Only the Politze knew that. A store in town was selling bread for Soviet money. There was a line, and I was also in line. We would come early. And suddenly, one man comes over, shouts Jew, grabbed us by the jackets, and threw us out of the line. You? Me as well. Others. Dozens. There were many of us Jews left. They came up to the line with our polizai. Well, and the polizai did know who was who, who was a Jew and who was Ukrainian, and they pointed with their fingers, Juden Raus, get the hell out. They gathered Jews and immediately put them to work. Well... <laughs> There were weak people who would carry something the wrong way. Well, there were times there was a hole in the ground and right away dropped them into the ground and buried them alive. There were beatings. There was tortures in every which way. And that's not to mention the rapes. The commandant forced the ghetto dwellers to yank out the grass on the side of the road with their teeth. Those who had no teeth, these were mostly elderly people, 
and those who tried to weed out the grass with their hands were beaten by the police on their fingers and back. They knock on the door and mother goes, Oh my God, it's the polizai. As soon as she shouted polizai, I got out of bed and jumped out of the window that overlooked the garden. They frog-marched grandma, grandpa, everybody, and threw them into a truck as if they were logs. The polizai and Germans walked from house to house and said, pack your valuables and everything. We're sending you to Palestine. Palestine? Yes, Palestine. My mother made me hide in the cellar and forced me into it and then had it covered with wood shavings. When it became dark in the evening, I got to thinking, where did they take them? And I went to my Aunt Maria. She asks me, where have you been? And I told her about what had happened. She says, let's go take a look. And the two of us went there. At the forest edge, there were old, how should I put it, they dug these large caponiers for tanks, so that the tanks could get into them and shoot from there. But nobody used them, so they used them. Germans did. They huddled people inside, made them strip and lie down, and then shot them in the back as they were lying prone. And then they would place another batch on top of them. This way, they gradually shot all of them. She, Maria, told me, don't go there, you shouldn't go there. But I said, no, I'll go there. And there was earth. It was covered with earth. It was late by then, it was night already, and the earth was breathing like this. I never want to recall it. I get really scared when I think, well, my little sister, maybe they buried my little sister alive. At first, they would spare people who had a profession, a tailor, a shoemaker. They didn't kill them at first. They killed people like my father, who was an old man without a profession. First, they killed children. My father had a grandson, Borya, a little boy. So, first, they killed him. Then they killed Clara, father's sister, right in front of them. And then they killed my parents. Hello, Uncle Misha. I am writing from my hometown of Zaslav, which you would no longer recognize. Only the miserable half of our village remains. It would have been better for it never to have existed. Better for me had I not been born into the world. I am no longer the Sunka you once knew. I no longer know who I am myself. It all seems like a dream, a nightmarish dream. Out of 4,000 people in Zaslav, only our neighbor, Kiva Feldman, and I are left my dear mama and papa, my sweet brother Zima, Isa, Sarah, Boruk, all of them are gone. You sweet dear people, how very hard it was for you. 
I cannot come to my senses. I cannot write. If I were to begin to tell you what I have lived through, I do not know how you could comprehend it. Three times I broke out of a concentration camp. More than once I have looked death in the eye while fighting in the ranks of the partisans. This letter is incoherent, as my life is incoherent and worthless. Nevertheless, I am still alive. For the sake of vengeance, I feel as though I have returned from the next world. I am now beginning a new life. The life of an orphan. How? I myself do not know. Write as often as possible. I await your reply. With warm greetings, your nephew, Sunya Deresh. 14th of April, 1944. One of the goals, the many goals, why we are erecting this monument is to restore historic justice. We certainly live in a world of great cynicism. If you look at this monument, the inscription says to innocent civilians of Izaslav, this is the best that the citizens of Izaslav could do at the time under the Soviet regime, because they couldn't write who was buried here even though everyone knew. They couldn't write that those were Jews. Hitler killed the Jews of Ukraine, but Stalin killed the memory of the Jews of Ukraine. When people knew of this killing place, the local Jewish population, the Ukrainians, the Russians, knew that it was Jews that had been killed, they had to write innocent Soviet civilians. That is in addition to the tragedy. The Soviet regime did not allow those people to be remembered. But that was my Russian Zaslav experience. They took us to the, uh, to the graveyard, which they were very proud of. It was very neatly kept. The gravestones were kept carefully kept. The grounds were kept nicely. A gated cemetery, small gated cemetery. And they showed me the, the headstone of my father's father, my paternal grandfather, with a picture of him. They, you know, they had these uh, on the headstones, the, the pictures of the deceased on the headstone. I recognized the picture from family pictures that I'd seen. So we had that contact, spoke a little Yiddish, and we went home. The cemetery we just visited vividly demonstrates how the connection between generations and culture was severed. Old monuments with Hebrew inscriptions are leaning over, some even lying. The graves are unkempt, overgrown with grass. The monuments in the new part of the cemetery are well-groomed, the graves are fenced, so the disregard for tradition is obvious. The continuity of culture has collapsed. The thread of traditions linking generations has been cut off. And the culture that has replaced it, the new traditions, are more Soviet than Jewish. They were very pastoral, and in a way very pretty. There was a lovely river ran through the town, the river banks, and it made me think about uh, What's the song? Uh, belts. Sind immer mungewene belts. Mein Städtle belts. Mein Himmel. Jeden Schabes flagge läufen dort. Sitzen unter dem kleinen Bäumle lernen bei den Teich. And I could see the tree and the banks of the river and the whole thing, you know, from belts. So it was pretty much what I expected. And the funny thing was, if I took a picture of that. There was a horse standing by the river, drinking from the river. It was perfect. The culture that I came from has always been a very important part of me, and I'm very grateful for it. In the early 70s, the Jewish exodus from Ukraine began. In reality, it was not one massive wave of repatriation, but several. In the early 80s, after the start of the war in Afghanistan and Sakharov's exile, the authorities decided to put a stop to immigration, and many of those who had previously applied for exit visas were refused. Or 20 refuseniks released at a time. They came to be called refuseniks in English. We can hear this interesting word, refusenik, in George Bush's speech. But people fought to leave. People fought to end up in the land of Israel. 
And in the early 1990s, this indeed became a mass exodus. Over the course of 30 years, from 1970 to 2000, about 630,000 Jews immigrated from Ukraine to Israel, the United States, Canada, Australia, and Germany. Today, only a few Jewish families, only 20 people, remain in Izaslav. Here is Aaron Berenboim's recording in 1999. All of my colleagues in Izaslav are gone. One of my Christian compatriots told me once while standing in line, Go to your Israel. And I also heard something similar from a lady in the market. I didn't go to my Israel, but rather to a strange Germany. But are they better off because of it? That's the question. Such is the history of Ukraine. Look, everything is side by side. Displays about the extermination of Jews by Bogdan Khmelnytsky. Jewish books, the history of Jews, are right next to the exploits of heroes of Ukraine, Pitlura and Bandera, who are responsible for thousands of destroyed Jewish lives. Anti-Semites and the subjects of their persecution, the Jews, or rather tokens of Jewish culture, are all under one roof. Jewish culture and history have become museum exhibits. Their conduits, the Jews, now constitute a minuscule percentage of the population in Ukrainian cities. Yesterday was a very hard day for us emotionally. When we came to see the monument, we walked in the vicinity and found remains, the bones of children, women, and men right here in the woods. We found the remains of footwear. We found a key that must have been in somebody's pocket. We felt very close, even though it had been 78 years since this tragedy had happened. There are a lot of temptations in the modern world. One can just live and not remember. But when you don't remember, one day you lose everything under your feet. You can't explain to your children who you are, where you came from. That's why memory is a powerful force. The monument, not only does it stand in the forest, it stands on people's bones, on real bones. It was not a battle. It was a massacre. When you see the numbers, a thousand people, over a thousand people, it stuns by its magnitude. But when you hold the bone of a child that has just been unearthed and imagine how the child snuggled up to his mother in there, in the earth, and all this was stirring. Here, there is simply nothing one could say. Under the roots of a fallen tree, we found fragments of footwear that was preserved, a key that someone probably had taken with them in hopes to come back home in order to open the house and return. But it was not fated for these people to come back. They all remained here, in this earth. As you know, yesterday we unveiled the second monument to the Holocaust victims. And I think that some of the people who are sitting here were even present at this monument's unveiling. This is the second monument that we have erected in Izaslav. But with this, we don't consider our mission finished. Now, we are together at the old Jewish cemetery of the city of Izaslav. Internments in this cemetery occurred mostly in the 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. The huge territory that we see before you, about 8 to 10 hectares, indicates how vast the community was in the city of Izaslav. It was a large Jewish settlement, a shtetl. Today, the cemetery is in a state of neglect, because there is nobody to take care of it. There are just seven Jewish families left. And in another 10 years, probably not a single one will be left. You would learn about the Jews in museums. Their history will remain in books and in these stones. The cemetery has not been used for a long time. They would come here, work oftentimes, but put it in order. We've lived here for about 40 years. They stroll here, relax. They even brought kindergarten kids here. 
showed them around. Cows graze here, eat the grass. This abandoned cemetery resembles the ruins of an ancient city. Tumbled gravestones with Hebrew inscriptions, grazing cows. Some gravestones have sunk into the ground, some stand upright like skeletons of buildings after a fire. As my relative and friend Joseph said, this is the end of the chapter. That's right. This is the end of Jewish life in Izaslav. In about 10 years, there will be no Jews left there, and Jewish culture and traditions will only remain in books, museums, and inscriptions on these stones, which no one can read. One might say that four centuries of Jewish life in Izaslav are over. Mm -hmm.